The year was 1982 and Jack was 21. The movie E.T. was released shortly before Jack's birthday. E.T. was a cute alien who gets separated from his group. He is befriended by some kids. It captured the attention of his generation and became the highest grossing movie for that year and remained unsurpassed for 11 years. Jack was a huge fan. He had a poster of E.T. in his room. Jack loved the character E.T. in the movie and would sometimes see him in his dreams. I am Dr. Rajiv Parinja. Welcome back to Brain Politics. In this episode, we go with Jack into a dream where he meets E.T., who, in this case, is an alien anthropologist, and we get some intriguing insights into human history and psychology. In one of our sessions, I and Jack had discussed how emotions can be illogical. This is true for both negative and positive emotions. We have discussed how we can experience negative emotions even when they don't make sense. Jack wondered if we sometimes miss out on experiencing positive emotions even when they do make sense. We discussed that we can sometimes make choices that allow us to get into a positive emotional state and experience the benefits that come with being in such a state. Jack had been thinking a lot about our discussions. He had also been pondering over all the things going on in the world. Artificial intelligence was becoming a big thing, and no one seemed to know where it would go from here. There was an increase in military conflicts. The news just felt depressing. He was wondering how to make sense of all that was happening in the world. Were things moving forwards or are we going backwards? Let's go with Jack into one of his dreams. Jack is taking a walk in the woods when he sees a cornfield. He sees E.T. hiding in the cornfield he invites the alien to his home and they start a conversation. Jack says to him, You look just like E.T. from the movie. E.T. says, Yes, but I am real. I am here on an important mission. What's your mission? asks Jack. E.T. replies, My mission is to try and understand how your world works. In my world, I am an expert who studies your world. But you guys have moved so fast in the last 200 years that we can't make sense of what is going on. I thought I would speak to you to try and understand how your world works. You see, our evolutionary history is very similar to yours. We can understand your psychology, but your social, economic and political systems are just so different and fast moving that we can't understand them. You guys have this thing called money which everybody seems to want and we don't understand what it does. You guys do all this work to produce things and we don't understand how you decide who does what work. Jack found that an interesting question. He was fascinated. He asked E.T. You said that things have moved fast in the last 200 years. How long have you been tracking us? E.T. replies, Well, we had estimated that your planet was likely to have intelligent life about 250,000 years ago. Our telescopes could give us an idea of the different chemicals in your atmosphere, and that was highly suggestive of life. Just like you guys now have the James Webb Telescope, which can give you the chemical composition of certain planets and their atmosphere. Our telescopes can give us an estimate of what gases were present in your atmosphere. The computers can then calculate the probability of intelligent life. 
We had a mission come to check on your planet about 200,000 years ago, and we saw that the Neanderthals were the dominant intelligent species at that time. You guys were very small in number at that time. We thought we would come back and check on you in about 100,000 years. When we came back, you guys had increased tremendously in your number and you were constantly in conflict with the Neanderthals. They were stronger than you, but you guys seemed to be a little smarter. We thought we would give it another 50,000 years and come back and see what was going on. When we came back at that time, your number was more than the Neanderthals and our computers projected that the Neanderthals would be extinct. We gave it another 40,000 years. When we came to check on you at that time, you were the dominant intelligent species on the planet. The Neanderthals were long gone, and you were beginning to make a transition from hunting and gathering to agriculture. Jack said, you've been tracking us for 250,000 years? How long do you guys live? E.T. replied, we actually don't live that much longer than you, but we have nuclear fusion-powered ships that can take us close to the speed of light. And when that happens, time slows down for us. That is amazing, said Jack. First, I want to know how your systems work. How do you get things done on your planet? How do you get what you need? E.T. replies, oh, that's very simple. Uh, my personal butler anticipates my needs and takes care of everything I need. I usually get whatever I need before I even ask for it. And if I don't, I can always ask for it and get it. You have a personal butler? says Jack. You must be rich. E.T. replies. I don't know what that means. I have come across that term a lot in your culture. I know that you humans love the idea of being rich. But how does one get rich? Jack says, well, not everyone can have a personal butler. You must be rich to have one. E.T. replies, no, everyone on our planet has a personal butler. Jack says, what? Even the butler has a personal butler? How is that possible? E.T. replies, oh no, the butler isn't a person. It's an artificially intelligent robot that uses machine learning to anticipate our needs and puts in orders to the robotic ecosystem to provide whatever we need. Everyone has a personal butler that gets to know them and provide whatever they want. The robots make sure that everything is produced in a fully recyclable manner and not likely to disrupt the nature's cycles in a way that puts them out of balance. Everyone can get whatever they want within reason. but. What does it mean to be rich? Jack replies, Well, if you have a lot of money, you are rich. E.T. says, And I have heard that term money used a lot. What does money mean? Jack says, Well, money is what you get paid when you do work and then you can use it to pay for things that you want. E.T. rolls his eyes and says, Just imagine for a moment that you are talking to an alien from another planet. Because you really are. This alien does not even understand the word money, and then try explaining it. This gets Jack thinking. He says, let's go back to the time when you came and saw us just discovering agriculture. Just imagine that there are two humans. One of them is growing chickens and the other one is trying to grow rice. They decide that they can exchange some chickens for some rice so that they can both eat chicken and rice instead of chickens alone or rice alone. They may agree on how much chicken is worth how much rice. Now imagine that the guy who is growing rice has a lot of rice in the harvest. He can't use it all before it gets spoiled, so he wants to give it away and in return he gets people to write IOUs on tree barks as a sort of agreement to return the favor from the people he gives rice to. He intends to use these to get stuff from them later when he has no rice. That IOU becomes money. In the old days, it had to be backed by something which was hard to procure, which could be rare stones or gold. Eventually, the leaders of large groups would mint coins which could be used in exchange for goods or services and were guaranteed in value by the leader. 
This process has developed over time, and now the government issues IOUs, which are called money, and the government backs them. You can borrow money by paying a little extra in interest, or you can lend money to get some money in interest. That is fascinating, says E.T. How do you decide how much money somebody gets? Well, says Jack, thinking about it for a moment, the amount of money depends on the value society places on the goods or services that you are providing to them. So if you are doing a simple job that might not require much training, you get paid less money. But if you do a job that requires a lot of training, you would typically get paid more. Of course, some people can set up businesses and companies that hire other people to deliver complex products and services, and they can make a lot of money. Interesting, says E.T. What kind of jobs pay the most money, asks E.T. Jack thinks about this for a moment and says, Well, I guess the highest paid people are top actors, top sports people, and rock stars. Why does your society value these skills so highly, asks E.T. Well, says Jack, it is not that society values these skills very highly, but you see, we have technology that allows many people to benefit from these talents. If an actor acts in a movie, that can be seen by millions of people across the world, and though each person might only spend a few dollars, it adds up. If a rock star records a song, millions of people may listen to it, and again, though each person pays only a small amount of money, it adds up. As technology improves, it is easier to access these products. I can stream just about any song on my smartphone. I see, says E.T. So you have developed technology to be able to record and distribute data. That is right, says Jack. That is intriguing, says E.T. You had none of this when we last checked on you guys 200 years ago. All of these high earners must be incredibly grateful to the people who developed the technology, allowing their work to be distributed so widely without much expense. Of course, says Jack. And then he pauses. He had never really heard anyone express gratitude to the inventors of the people of recording technology for audio or video. In fact, some of these high achievers had a reputation for being highly entitled. Jack told E.T. that he hadn't really heard anyone express gratitude to the people who invented recording technology. E.T. says, I wonder why people don't feel grateful. Gratitude is an emotion that comes when somebody does something for you. Jack thought for a moment. He went back to our sessions and thought that there's got to be an evolutionary explanation for this. So he came up with a hypothesis. He said that expressing gratitude has got to serve a function. Gratitude makes the recipient of gratitude more likely to do the things that would help the people expressing gratitude. However, in the case of technology, the people are working on technology anyway, and expressing gratitude may not make a big difference. I guess that makes sense, said E.T. Emotions are not always logical, but they can be chosen by directing our attention. I think people are missing out on an opportunity to feel grateful for a lot of things in your world. It would make them feel better, make other people feel better, and it would be good for your mental and physical health. On our planet, we learn to practice positive emotions. The idea of practicing positive emotions captured Jack's attention. He wanted to know more about it, but the conversation moved on. E.T. once again expressed his disbelief at the rate of human progress. He said, When we had visited 200 years ago, our algorithms had predicted that you will invent the telegraph in 10 to 20 years. We thought that this would allow you to communicate across long distances far more quickly than sending messengers who were traveling on horseback or foot at that time. And now you have all this technology which came about really fast. We haven't had a chance to understand it. You really had no medical science 200 years ago, and now you can treat so many diseases. Your rate of progress is staggering, and surprising because we had expected progress so many times in the past, 
but it never quite came about. Now Jack's curiosity was piqued. What do you mean, says Jack? When had you expected progress and it didn't come about? Have you heard of the Antikythera? asks E.T. Jack says that he has not, but he wants to know about E.T.'s previous visits. So E.T. takes up the story. I told you about our visits up to the time when Neanderthals became extinct and you became the dominant species. There was a lot of violence within your species. When you were hunter-gatherers, a third of all men would be killed by other men. Even those who didn't get killed often got into fights that left them with injuries. When we came 10,000 years ago, your species had discovered agriculture. This allowed your numbers to grow as you had more food, but it created a lot of problems. When you didn't have enough food, you suffered from famines. And as your population grew larger, you became vulnerable to infections that would spread from one person to another. You also formed larger groups that could wage organized battles with more people because you didn't have to spend all the time hunting and gathering for food. The overall violence began to go down and we saw that as a good thing. We came back 5,000 years ago and we saw that your ancestors had developed civilizations. In the Indus Valley, you had cities with straight roads, drains and houses with windows. The Mesopotamians were trading with other civilizations and had got beautiful architecture. The Egyptians worshipped a frog god and they made beautiful art. Do you know about the frog god? asks E.T. Jack had never heard of the frog god. He found the concept a little strange, and he said as much. E.T. appeared to be upset with him about it. E.T. said, You should not belittle somebody's religion, even if it doesn't make any sense to you. Religious beliefs are very personal for you guys. They become a part of your identity. Jack acknowledges this and mutters an apology. E.T. tells him that nobody believes in the frog god anymore and the statue of the frog god from 5,000 years ago is now kept in the Cleveland Museum of Art. Jack feels a little relieved. E.T. continues the story. We decided to come back in 3,000 years and saw that the Greek civilization was going strong at that time. Your violence rate had decreased for individuals, though your wars had become more complex and localized, leading to spurts of violence killing lots of people. We were impressed with the technology. These guys had got gears and simple mechanical computers that could predict basic astronomical positions of the moon, the sun, and some planets. The Antikythera was a mechanical computer that the Greeks had. It was found in a shipwreck about a hundred years ago, and your generation used modern imaging techniques from medicine to understand how it works. We were very impressed with this technology and some of our algorithms at that time predicted that you would be sending rockets into space in five to six hundred years. But your social and political systems were very primitive. The Romans were killing thousands of people each year for entertainment in brutal ways. We were shocked that people were killed in such large numbers for no reason other than entertainment. That appeared to be a new low for your species. Jack was feeling a little ashamed. But he was curious at the same time about Greek technology. What happened to all that technology? He asked. You had predicted that we would have rockets going into space. We don't know, said E.T. We weren't here. But our best guess is that the leaders who held power were either attacked by somebody or they attacked somebody, leading to the technological development being stopped. And what was developed was lost. It would take another 1500 years before you would get back to the same level of technology. Jack made some general remarks about how things have improved since the ancient Romans. E.T. agreed heartily. You guys have done spectacularly well in a very short time, he said. 
your violence rates are way down and it appears that you have improved continuously for the last several hundred years. You have created societies where more people have a say in how their lives are going. Fewer people are being exploited by other more powerful people. In large parts of the world, you have largely eliminated slavery. There is no country in the world today where slavery is legal, even though it is covertly practiced in many parts of the world. You have organizations which espouse violence, but no large group is doing violence purely for the sake of entertainment, like the Romans did. You guys have an amazingly safe world compared to your past. You must be very grateful for all this progress, said E.T. This seemed to be high praise, but it was not quite in keeping with how Jack was feeling about the world. Have you seen our news? asked Jack. There are problems everywhere. There's a lot of crime. There is political instability. There are wars in many parts of the world. You're right about that, said E.T. A lot of people continue to suffer due to all of the things that you said. But on average, you have gone from one in three men dying because they were killed by somebody to less than one in hundred men dying from being killed by somebody. I think that's a huge improvement. Jack again said that he felt that the world was quite dangerous. E.T. did not disagree and suggested that the goal should be zero deaths from violence. But you have a lot to be grateful for to all the people who came before you, E.T. said. There are many people who risked and sometimes gave up their lives to move things along over the last 1,000 years so that you could have the life that you have, with more freedom, more opportunity, comfort and safety than ever before. Jack pondered over that for a little bit and then wondered aloud if that was really true. Think about it for a moment, said E.T. The best time to be a human has been in your lifetime. It is within the last 20 years. Things got a little worse during your recent pandemic, but there has never been a better time in your history of 200,000 years to be a human on this planet. After some consideration, Jack conceded the point. E.T. told Jack that he liked the idea of evolutionary hypotheses. We do not experience emotions that we logically should, but evolution determines which emotions are picked up based on how our attention and judgment are tweaked by the evolutionary process. E.T. told Jack that he had been listening to NPR, and he heard a segment about something called the liking gap. When you guys meet somebody new, said E.T., you systematically underestimate how much that person likes you. The people you meet like you better than you think they do. When I was listening to that segment, I was wondering why this is the case. I think I have an evolutionary hypothesis that can explain it. If you underestimate how much somebody likes you, you are more likely to keep making an effort to connect with them and be likable. That is good for you socially. If you had a more accurate assessment of how much they liked you, you may become complacent and make less effort to be likable which could put you at a relative disadvantage. I think you guys tend to pay attention to negative things because that is advantageous from an evolutionary point of view and you ignore positive things. Your problems have not disappeared with improved technology, but you have to learn to pay attention to the things that are going well. In our world, we no longer have most of the problems that you experience. In our world, everybody can get whatever they want, so they are all rich. There is nobody who needs help. We have to train ourselves to stay in a positive emotional state because it is quite easy to get bored and then get into a negative spiral. My group enjoys travel through the galaxies to find intelligent civilizations and study how they function. It feeds our curiosity and we enjoy it. It is also important to develop spiritually because that protects mental health and overall well-being. You have spirituality too? asks Jack. Sure we do, says E.T. Our brains are quite similar to yours and we experience emotions and spirituality just like you do. We recognize that spirituality is quite important for emotional well-being. Let's talk about that in our next meeting. Jack woke up from his dream 
and brought it to our therapy session at the following appointment. Is it really true that we are not paying attention to all the positive things that are happening in the world? I can see that we have improved a lot from historical times and in theory we should be grateful for it, but it just doesn't feel like it. That is right, I told Jack. The fact is that the safest, most comfortable time to be alive has been in our lifetimes, but all the problems that we still have distract us from this fact and make us experience negative emotions. There is a lot of data to support deliberate practice of positive emotions such as gratitude. It helps our mental health and changes our behavior in ways that is better for us and for the people around us. It makes us more caring, more compassionate, as well as less depressed and less anxious. I am really curious about spirituality, I said. I wonder what E.T. will tell you about it. I wonder if there is a way to practice spirituality that would cross galactic boundaries. I am really curious to hear about it as well from E.T., said Jack. We will talk about it in our next session. I hope you will join me. If you have questions or comments, please go to wgte.org slash brainpolitics. I am Dr. Rajiv Parinja. I am your host and producer. Our executive producer is Chris Pfeiffer. This is Brain Politics. I hope you will join me for the next episode. WGTE. Voices around us. WGTE is supported in part by American Rescue Plan Act funds allocated by the City of Toledo and the Lucas County Commissioners and administered by the Arts Commission.